Hi, everyone. Hi from Silver Spring, Maryland. Sorry, we can't be in Chicago this year, but uh, it's nice that we can share work from a distance. So my talk is going to be about limitations in cryptography. So the general philosophy is that we are seeking out the limits of what we're able to do in order to get a better understanding of what we can do. And with that in mind, I'm going to start with a simple example of an impossibility proof in cryptography. And that is two-party classical coin flipping without computational assumptions. So here's the model that we're using, and I'm going to describe it in a little bit of detail because it's going to be important for starting off the talk. So basically you have two parties and they want to carry out a coin flip together and they each have a stated interest. Alice wants the outcome to be zero. Bob wants the outcome to be one. And they do this by a classical dialogue that ends with them each announcing what they think the outcome of the coin flip was, heads or tails, zero, one. The goal is that, first of all, they will always uh, both agree if they're honest on what the outcome was. And secondly, that neither party, if they cheat, can skew the results too much in the direction of their favorite outcome. With a short argument, you can convince yourself that this is actually not possible. And uh, here's the reasoning. So basically, the only way to ensure that the bits A and B are going to agree at the end of the protocol is if they are deterministic functions of the transcript of communication. And unfortunately, that means we are essentially in a setting of a competitive two-player game. If we consider Alice to have won when the outcome is zero and Bob to have won when the outcome is, is one, then then essentially uh, they're just they're competing and they're playing a deterministic uh, two-player game and so therefore a winning strategy exists. That means one or the other of them um, has a strategy that will allow them to force the desired outcome with probability one. So that, uh, that protocol unfortunately is not going to work and there's at least two ways we can go from there. Um, we, we need to change the model in order to get something. Uh, so one direction to go is that we can do classical coin flipping with computational assumptions, which is a rich field. And the other way to go, another way to go is quantum coin flipping, uh, where we introduce quantum communication into uh, the scheme. So same basic setup, except we're now using quantum communication channel. The impossibility proof that I just gave no longer applies. And this is what we're going to call quantum weak coin flipping. So the reason we say weak is that we have assumed that we know each of the player's interests. We know their desired outcome. If we don't know that, and they might try to skew it in either direction towards zero or towards one, then we call it strong coin flipping. But strong coin flipping is already known to be impossible, except with a, a fixed amount of bias, a fixed positive amount of bias. So, uh, so that's why we're focusing on weak coin flipping. So we measure the ability, uh, we measure how good a protocol is based on the cheating probabilities for Alice and for Bob. And the, we basically say the bias is the maximum of PA minus one half and PB minus one half, where PA and PB are those cheating probabilities. And our goal is to get that figure as close to zero as possible. This topic has a very long history. It goes back to um, at least to Bennett and Broussard's original quantum cryptography paper in 1984. They proposed key distribution, which is very famous, and also coin tossing in the same paper. And just a brief sketch, um, the way they describe it, it is basically transmitting polarized photons across a quantum channel. So the quantum states in this case are the polarizations of those photons. And Alice prepares these randomly polarized uh, photons. Bob measures them in random states. And the goal is to get a fair coin flip out of that. Um, the particular protocol that they proposed, they acknowledged uh, uh, wasn't um, secure in the most general sense because Alice could break it by using entanglement. But this opened the door to uh, further protocols. So looking at the most general model where basically we are, so. Quantum cryptography is based on physical assumptions. In this case, the physical assumption is just that um, if Alice transmits information to Bob and Bob has that information, then Alice can no longer perform any quantum operations on it and vice versa. So Alice can have no effect on Bob's systems. Bob's 
can have no effect on hers. Um, with that as our security assumption, there were starting in the 90s, uh, some um, uh, positive results proving gradually improved biases for weak quantum coin flipping. And you can see this progression starting with 0.42 and then gradually improving from there. The protocols tended to get more complex as the bias went down. And then in 2007, there was this landmark paper by Carlos Muchan, who proved a family of weak coin flipping protocols where the bias can be made arbitrarily close to zero. And it's a pretty amazing paper. It's this 80 page paper, lots of mathematics. And, um, and he presented a family and a number of researchers have built on that since then. Um, basically delving further into what uh, this family that he introduced, making it more explicit and constructive. Um, and, uh, and so that was, and that was the uh, first time that this had been shown that you could bring the bias as close to zero as you wanted it to be. And what I want to call attention to is, uh, so despite uh, some great work that's been done on the theory side of this paper, there have been, as far as I know, no performance improvements, at least among published papers, there's no um, uh, improvements over the, uh, the amount of space or the number of rounds used by Mushan's uh, protocol. And that's unfortunate because actually it was a very inefficient protocol. It used one over epsilon to the O of one over epsilon rounds of quantum communication in order to achieve bias epsilon. So we got this exponential figure um, that is, is not remotely practical. And, um, and the question is, the, why in the last 13 years have we not seen any improvements to this figure? You can compare that to the progression of like quantum key distribution where, you know, we had uh, great improvements, steady improvements in the field and now it's being experimentally implemented. Um, so the question we're interested in is why um, haven't we seen the same kind of progression in uh, quantum coin tossing? Okay, so uh, the way I'm going to go from here is that I'm going to first reintroduce some uh, known theoretical tools for this problem and then add a few new tools of my own and then I'll state the main results of the talk. So starting with uh, a central idea which is attributed to Kateyev and that was uh, very important in Mashan's paper and that is the idea of a point game. So a point game is basically, it is a simple mathematical construction that is in almost perfect correspondence with the class of quantum weak coin flipping protocols. And the reason we study point games is because they are so much mathematically simpler. Um, and questions about coin flipping protocols can be easily reduced to these, um, well, I shouldn't say easily, but can be reduced to uh, these um, neat mathematical objects. So basically what a point game is, is that it is, um, it's, a, it's a solitaire game where you have certain configurations and you have certain rules for transforming those configurations and you're trying to get from one configuration to another. So specifically, what we're dealing with are probability distributions of points, either on a line or on a plane. And we have valid transformations by which we can take one probability distribution and replace it with another. Specifically, this is the central rule. If I have one probability distribution on, um, let's say, the set of non-negative real numbers, and what we're calling that distribution V, um, and I want to replace it with another distribution W, I am allowed to do that provided that this inequality holds. So this is an inequality in expectation of a certain rational function um, applied to the, uh, the X coordinate of these points, provided that this um, this infinite family of inequality holds, then it's what we call a valid move, valid transition. And I'm allowed to replace V with W. So then a, a valid point game is one which is played on a two-dimensional grid in the upper right-hand corner, uh, uh, corner uh, two-dimensional plane, and where I'm allowed to carry out these valid moves on any a row or any column. So anytime I have points collected on a single row or in a single column, I'm allowed to make valid moves. And, and so I, I will give a few examples of this. So ultimately, if you want to check whether transition is okay, the only sure way to do it is to go back and check that formula. But there are certain easily described um, families of moves that are allowed. 
So one of them is if we do what's called a merge. So right there, I just took two points on the same column and I merged them together. You can always do that. Another is to do a split. I just took a point and split it um, within a row. Um, it's important that splits are not the opposite of merges. They're not, they're not inverse to merges. So if you split and then merge, you don't necessarily get back what you started with. Moves in general are not reversible, which is one of the things that makes point games hard. And then you also have the more complicated moves. Like there, I just took three points and replaced them with two other points. Um, you do need the more complicated moves. Merge and, merges and splits are not enough. Merges and splits are only part of the vocabulary. You kind of need the whole range. Okay, so, so that's point games. And the reason that we care about them is because of this amazing correspondence with weak coin flipping protocols. So specifically, a weak coin flipping protocol corresponds to a valid point game from these two green points to this red point. So it's a valid point game where the starting configuration is those two green points on the axis, on the, on the X and Y axes. And then the final configuration is just the single point, uh, the single red point. And I've written the coordinates of these points here, but the, the main, um, main thing to note is the red point is slightly above the midpoint of those two green points. And we know it's impossible, you can easily prove it's impossible to get below that midpoint. The question is whether you can get slightly above it. Um, so there's this correspondence between those valid point games and the weak coin flipping protocols. And uh, moreover, you can read off the properties of these protocols by looking at their valid point games. Most importantly for us, the number of rounds in the coin flipping protocol corresponds to the number of moves in the point game. So what this has essentially given us is, this is a quick way, uh, this is a magic box way of reducing the whole communication efficiency question to a mathematical problem. And that problem is, can I get in a, using valid moves from the green configuration to the red configuration um, without too many of those moves? Can I keep that number of moves to be something polynomial or maybe logarithmic in say one of epsilon? So that's essentially what the communication efficiency question comes down to. Okay, so if I'd seen this for the first time, I would probably think, that this was, it would be easy from here on um, because we had this nice characterization. Unfortunately, it's not because valid point games actually turn out to be really hard to construct. If you try to just search them out by computer, I, you know, you'll probably find it's a huge search space and a really complex one. So um, taking the direct approach to this turns out not to be so easy. So when I was um, approaching this, so I, um, I kind of um, uh, learned all this from uh, previous papers and I was thinking, okay, well, since these valid point games are hard to construct, why don't we try to do something easier first and take a step towards the general problem. So I defined these things I'm gonna call legal point games. Same basic idea as a valid point game, but I'm gonna make the rules a lot simpler. I'm just gonna have one rule. Um, you can transform one probability distribution into another uh, along a single row, let's say. Um, provided that you don't decrease the x coordinate, and likewise for transformations along a column. Much easier to deal with since it's just a one condition instead of an infinite number. And then we can ask the question first of all, given two probability distributions, can I get from one to another using a legal transformation? And secondly, how can I actually find the strategies that will do that? So, this it turns out is not as hard and we can actually get a pretty solid answer. So specifically, uh, given two probability distributions S and T, you can get from S to T using legal moves, both horizontal and vertical, um, if three conditions hold. Now the left arrow I, I wrote almost because you need to make these inequalities strict in order for that to hold. But you know, modulo and arbitrarily small error, uh, this is a necessary and sufficient condition. Okay, so what we have here is two obvious criteria. We already knew we, that uh, the expected value of the x-coordinates and the expected value of the y-coordinates couldn't um, decrease. 
if we're applying valid moves. And then um, kind of the key observation was that you need one more condition to make this necessary and sufficient. And that is that the expected value of x times y does not decrease when you go from probability distribution s to probability distribution t. That additional thing, which is, which is not too hard to prove is something necessary, that turns out to be all we need in order to establish uh, sufficiency. And um, it also turns out, fortunately, that computing the actual moves that will get us from S to T is not too hard. It's, um, it's, it's certainly not trivial, but uh, you can do it with uh, linear algebra. Okay, so legal point games, not too difficult. Let's go back to valid point games. Can we do something similar? Well, maybe so. So I define this thing that I called the profile of a probability distribution on the plane. And it is based on the criteria that we were just looking at and also the definition of a valid move. And it simply looks like that. What it is, is instead of just three quantities, I have a two dimensional family of quantities each of them is an expectation over this probability distribution S. And the key observation is, just like what we were looking at before, these are monotones. Uh, if you apply a valid move, either horizontal or vertical, none of these quantities can go down. They can only stay the same or go up. And that gives us some guidance if we're trying to figure out how to get from one configuration to another. Now the observation um, this, so this was originally a tool that I found to try to search out um, uh, valid point games. The, the first surprise in the proof was to discover just how rigid um, these profile functions have to be in order to achieve the transition that we want to achieve, in order to achieve that transition from green to red. So specifically, if hypothetically there were, we, we had a, um, valid point gain that took us from green to red, like for example, one of Mushan's protocols, then necessarily the profiles have to have a particular shape. So specifically, if I look, uh, if I take a thin horizontal strip in the plane and I look at all the horizontal moves that occur within that thin horizontal strip, then the profiles of those moves, by which I mean the difference between the profiles of the um, final configurations and their initial configurations, has to look like that. What we have basically here is, so it's a, it's a two dimensional function that is very large on uh, uh, near one particular horizontal line and is very close to zero elsewhere. And what I'm asserting is essentially we know the structure of the profile of this strip uh, of, the, of the point game up to a term that vanishes as epsilon goes to zero. So in that sense, it's highly rigid. And this is, this is good news and bad news. I mean, it's good news in the sense that this gives us a lot of information about what we're looking for when we're searching out a valid point game. Um, but it also means we have a bunch of constraints that are actually pretty hard to satisfy. Um, we, need to, we now know we need, in order to, uh, to succeed, to actually get the point games that we're looking for, we need to find uh, moves that will actually fit this tight um, condition. Okay. So, so those are profile functions. And at this point, I'm gonna step back and look at the big picture and we're gonna build up the main results of this talk, um, which are based on the graphs actually that we were just looking at. So we wanted to solve this question of communication efficiency. And this is basically what we have to start with. So actually, um, not that much was known about the possible range of um, communication, number of communication rounds that can be achieved for given, given biases. Um, so Andros Ambanis proved um, a good result back in 2004, showing that at least the rounds are non-constant and they have to be above omega of log log of one over epsilon. Um, and that, um, that leaves a, a very big range because uh, the, only, the only upper bound we had was that upper bound of Mushan's that was uh, one over uh, epsilon to the O of one over epsilon. So the optimal communication efficiency lies somewhere in between those two figures. It'd be nice if we could prove it was less than O of log of one over epsilon. Failing that, maybe linear or polynomial in one over epsilon. Um, so these are sort of the various levels that we could wish for. 
The bad news is that actually neither of those um, uh, abounds uh, holds. And it turns out that this is what we have. We actually have that the number of communication rounds is greater than or equal to exponential of omega one over square root of epsilon. So we can't do, we can't do logarithmic and we can't do polynomial either. And there's a reason then that uh, Mushan's um, protocol had to have so many rounds. And where this comes from is that it is basically um, the result of that rigidity um, assertion that I was just showing in the previous section of this talk. We were looking at those highly pinched functions. Well, it turns out that mathematically, if you're gonna achieve a highly pinched function like that, um, the only way to do it is if you, uh, so these are, these are rational functions. The only way to do it is if these rational functions have exponentially large poles. And in the context of a point game, in the context of the profile function, what that means is you have to have a point game with an exponential number of moves. That's the only way you can get a profile that has um, an exponentially sized poles. So, uh, so what that basically means for us is it, it translates this simple mathematical property back into an assertion about the number of moves that are necessary in a point game. And that is where this theorem uh, comes from. So this is what the path to quantum coin flipping looks like at this point. It's not exactly a brick wall, but it is uh, a direction you probably don't want to go because you're not going to get very far, unfortunately. But that's certainly not the end of the story because um, there's much we can do from here. So one direction that I think uh, continues to be very interesting is um, optimizing imperfect quant uh, quantum coin flipping. So um, there's nothing in my result that says we can't do, say, like 1% bias um, in, a, in a reasonably efficient manner. I, um, I think that's an unknown, uh, whether that, uh, that can be done. Um, also, studying coin flipping in other models, models where this impossibility result wouldn't hold. Um, what I'm very interested in is relativistic, where you have parties um, scattered in space and you assume that information can't travel faster than the speed of light. You do that, that changes the game, and it's, it's possible that um, uh, efficient coin flipping uh, could still be done. And lastly, looking for other applications of point games. I think these are highly versatile um, objects, and it would be interesting to see if they could be applied to um, cryptographic tasks other than coin flipping. So with that, um, thanks for your attention, and I would also like to say thanks to some colleagues.